On June the 12th, Ontarians will find themselves choosing a new parliament based presumably on what happens over the next five and a half weeks on the hustings. Joining us now for more on what we can expect, Syria Grell, former Deputy Director of Communications for Premier Kathleen Wynne. Paul Rhodes, former Communications Director for the Ontario PC Party. Joanne Deere, former Communications Director for the New Democratic Party. Chris Tyndall, former strategist and candidate for the Green Party. And Martin Regcon, Ontario politics columnist with the Toronto Star. And it's good to have everybody around our table tonight as we kick off election 41. We know, of course, that the NDP precipitated this election campaign, but I guess I want to start with the following. Paul, if you were in the Liberal shoes right now, do the Liberals want an election right now? No, clearly not. They were prepared for one. But the way that budget was crafted was crafted in such a way that uh, the Liberals could have it both ways. They had an activist agenda with a lot of promises, very appealing. They attempted to box in uh, Andrea Horvath. But at the same time, they can say, well, we, here's a platform we can run on. So they have got it going both ways. My sense is, just in watching the first couple of days prepared, but I don't get the sense they really want this campaign. They would have rather have gone through for the full term and, and what government wouldn't, quite frankly. How about you, Chris? The Liberals want an election right now? Oh, I was, I was all ready to answer to the Greens won an election. No, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think so. I think it's, it's obvious that you know, they, they wanted to keep going. And I think that their, the budget to me looked like um, an election campaign, but probably <clears throat> one that they would rather try implementing in government rather than on the campaign trail. Joanne? I think they might have actually wanted one. I mean, you know, you got to look at where things are going with the gas plant scandal and wonder, you know, how much worse are things going to get? You know, maybe they're calculating better now so we can turn the page and get it over with rather than six months down the road. I mean, you know, things could get even worse for them there. And obviously, you know, they were very prepared. Kathleen Wynne had her bus this morning. So, uh, you know, obviously they were ready to go. They had, a, I think, their first rally Friday night, didn't they? Yeah, budget was impl uh, introduced on a Thursday, first rally Friday night. I think that was supposed to be a staff party for the budget. Yeah. <laughs> Hastily. <laughs> it turned into something else. Yeah. Did the Liberals want to go now? I, I think it was exactly what these guys were talking about. They, they wanted to see which way it could go. I'm sure they would have happily kept governing. Um, but I don't think they're disappointed that the uh, Justice Committee isn't going to be sitting next week. And hearing more testimony on gas plants and so on. I'm a little disappointed. I kind of wanted to see that Peter Face no, guy. No, did. did I? <laughs> yeah, I think you're kidding. <laughs> Maybe just a little bit. <laughs> Martin, how about it? I think we have to remember that the worst day in government is better than the best day in opposition. So there's no way that Kathleen Wynne wanted to give up power now. That's not to say that her organizers, her campaign organizers, weren't chomping at the bit. I think they were, when you spend all that time preparing, it's very hard to kind of call, call off the horses and turn back at the last minute. So once you maintain that momentum, you're ready to go. From Kathleen Wynne's point of view, on the upside waiting, she would have been able to benefit maybe from a better economy. On the downside, she's got some labor negotiations ahead of her this year that could cause more trouble. Mm -hmm. Your excellent friend, John McEtitian, with whom you've been on this program a couple of times, right. uh, one of the last times he was on, we talked about this issue of timing and who benefits by going now or waiting, etc. I want to play you a little bit of what he had to say, and then we'll come back. And, uh, and I'm just kidding. You just met him. He's actually your longtime friend. No, I've known John for years, sure. Yes, you have. We're okay. secretly dating. I really? <laughs> also don't think that's true either. But any, that can, can you roll this pl tape, please, and get me out of here? Go ahead. <laughs> if I look at what's in the NDP's best interest, it would be to give this investigation enough time. I think, if anything, there's a solid reason now to say, whoa, we're not rushing into an election where people can say, hey, it wasn't me, nobody I know. Uh, met the guy once. Um, what what will happen is a thorough police investigation and either no charges or charges and then that becomes more fascinating. Now we won't by the end of this mandate if there are charges get to a legal case but the, the charges, if I was the leader of the NDP, I'd prefer going into an election with a set of charges against the Liberal Premier's office as opposed to Fated an, investi a fa an investigation. Joanne, I have to tell you, I hear that a lot that in terms of timing, since it was the NDP's choice of when to have this election, by voting no confidence in the budget, or would have, uh, you took some arrows out of your quiver and threw them on the ground. Is that a fair point? Well, let's not forget the Conservatives also voted against the budget. It wasn't just us. Um, but, you know, I, I think you really have to look at the calculation. I mean, how long do you wait? The NDP has played a very large role in uncovering these scandals. And, and really making sure that this stuff has gone public. So, you know, I think on the other side, if we had supported the budget, 
it, it kind of looks bad in some ways that, you know, you're, you've been saying, telling us all this time how corrupt this government is and uncovering all of these scandals, whether, you know, Orange, eHealth, you know, they've been piling up. And so at some point you just have to say that, you know, this government doesn't have, you know, the support of Ontarians anymore. And, and I really believe that, you know, the NDP was out there and we've been you know, talking to people and listening to people and, and people are really kind of fed up. And I don't think it would have looked very good actually on the NDP if we'd, you know, given all of that, then said, okay, it's all right, but we're going to wait a little longer. Well, Paul, could, could Andrea Horvath have said, look, at, we all know what our feelings about this government are. However, there's a new pension plan for retirement income security in this budget. There's a tax on high income earners. There's new money for early ed childhood education workers. There's new money for personal support workers. There's a few things to like about this budget, so we're going to hold our noses and pass it, and we'll deal with this again in a year. I was very impressed with the interview that Andrea Horvath did uh, earlier in the show, where she said, look, I can't believe any of this. There's too much in this. I mean, even Andrea Horvath is showing glimmers of restraint in government spending as far as, uh, as, far as compared to Kathleen Wynne is concerned. I, I think there was a sense around Queen's Park, and, and certainly a sense across the provinces, you know, We've actually had enough of these people. Uh, they, they've been in for a year. Uh, we haven't had the chance to or vote on, on Kathleen Wynne. Well, I'm talking specifically about Kathleen Wynne. We haven't had a chance to vote on her. And sort of enough was enough. And I think uh, Andrea Horvath made the decision that she needed to make. I'm not sure it was a decision that she wanted to make personally. I think she was very torn. And so if Kathleen Wynne didn't want the election, and Andrea Horvath might have been back and forth a bit. I mean, the only people that want this election is us. We're looking forward to it. Let's, let's get it done. You, you wanted it the second after Kathleen Wynne won the leadership at Maple Leaf Gardens. Absolutely right. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think that you might be underestimating what she thinks about this election. I think she stands a pretty good chance against Tim, Tim Hudak, frankly. Who's the she? Uh, Kathleen Wynne. Okay. I don't think she's actually that scared of Tim Hudak. Well, I think she scared, feels pretty good going up against want this. him. Would rather still be in government. Well, you know, she, she likes being in government, obviously. I think she's quite good at it. But I think, you know, she has been in there for a year. And I think she, she, wants, she wants to be able to govern without an asterisk, right? Without people saying, oh, you're the unelected premier. So I think she kind of welcomes the opportunity to say, okay, let's put it to a vote. Let's let people decide whether they like me or they like Tim Hudak. And then I can go on about what I'm doing. <coughs> what do you say, Chris? Well, it's interesting because the Liberals have often, in, in recent general elections, have entered as the underdog, and it's always looked like a bad idea. And then, and then they've been better at campaigning than the other parties. So it'll be interesting to see. Which is if, not too hard. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's true, though. I think that in in Ontario, the bar is. I I felt very cynical as a voter. I feel like the bar's been been pretty low. And and you even hear that in sometimes in the rhetoric, say, well, sure, we're bad, but we're not as bad as they are. Um, that that feels like sometimes the level of, of debate at, at the Ontario level. Um, so we'll see we'll see how it turns out. And that out. worries me actually about Horvath having to deal with this. I think it's very cynical to say it's your fault that this government fell on this budget. Like I think that that actually has a negative impact for a lot of voters saying, are we really going to spend a week debating whose fault this is? Like let's talk about right. what you want to do. Like I think that this whole conversation is actually bad for everybody. Yeah, but it's inevitable in the first couple of days. And there's 41 days yeah, of campaigning, so we'll, we'll move on to other things, trust me. <laughs> but what about that? Do you think the timing of the NDP's decision to take this government down, could they have made a different decision? Absolutely. But I think we have to have some sympathy for the position that Andrea Horvath found herself in. I think she had painted herself into a bit of a corner, not through incompetence, but it's hard to play opposition leader part of the day and then enabler for the Liberals at, at the other time of day. So I don't fault her for saying... Uh, time's up, even though she did say that she wanted to make minority government work, and two and a half years is not bad as minority government cycles go. What I think we have to be candid to our viewers about is why she's calling the election. So if she says she's calling the election because she doesn't trust the Liberal government to deliver... That's what she says. That strains credibility a little bit, because, okay. because a Liberal government, as I think you pointed out in some of your questioning, has delivered reasonably well on some of those issues. I mean, auto insurance, my auto insurance rates went up as well the last two years, but I understand what an average is. And on, on average, the superintendent has said that insurance rates have gone down about five or six points, percentage points, uh, which is about not bad for halfway through a two-year cycle. The question is, how are you going to deliver a pension plan if you're Andrew Horvath? How are you going to deliver on minimum wage indexation, as you point out, if you're Andrew Horvath, if you're the third party with 21 seats? doesn't mean she shouldn't try, just as Jack Layton tried when he brought down the Paul Martin government. But what's the real reason? The real reason is, time's up, 
tired of being an enabler, don't want to be poisoned by being playing second fiddle as a third party in a minority government, but because it, it never goes well for the for the, uh, the 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 supporting actor in a minority government. Well, let me put another idea on the table, Joanne, and that would be if you're Andrew Horvath, you've forced this election because you think you can do better. You think you can improve your seat count. I mean, that's the only reason at the end of the day you do this, isn't it? Well, not always. I mean, you know, I know it sounds crazy, but maybe sometimes political leaders aren't always just looking out for their own party's best interest. You know, I, that I does do. does sound crazy. I know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I do believe that, you know, I mean, Andrea is the kind of person who I really believe is, you know, when she says she's trying to do things better for Ontario families, that she really does believe that. And, and of course, you're always taking a bit of a gamble when you go to election. And we've seen, you know, Pauline Marois, of course, you know, is someone else who took, didn't think she was taking a gamble, but right. look how that ended. So, you know, whenever you go into a campaign, I think, you know, all of the leaders right now should be a little nervous. I think anything can happen over the next uh, few weeks. Can I just and pick up on so that? You never know. Is that true? You've all seen a hell of a lot of elections around this table. And in almost every single election, not anything can happen. There's only a very small number of things that can happen. Paul, in this election, can anything happen? Yes. And why do you say that? Uh, be because I think that what has happened is there has been no real consensus on government direction. Uh, and it's been almost government by default. We have a scandal-ridden liberal government that is really well past its best before date and is Kathleen Wynne renewal. Tim Hudak offers a very different vision for the direction of uh, Ontario of fiscal responsibility, a million jobs plan, which is strongly contrasting what the NDP and Liberals would like to do. Andrea Horvath, in three by-elections, where they had uh, not held seats ever or for a very long time, came up, defeated the Liberals because their vote collapsed locally, and pushed us aside, mm -hmm. uh, including a riding in which we'd held. So, when I take a look at the by-election record, I take a look at the performance of uh, an NDP leader and a Conservative leader who've been in a race before, along with an untried Liberal leader who also happens to be the Premier, and campaigning is hard uh, with a new team. There are so many variables going on right now, I wouldn't make a prediction on this campaign if you paid me. Even if I paid you. Even if you paid me. There's a number, there's an amount he could pay. <laughs> well, no, no, not even if you paid me. I, I, because I wouldn't want to be that wrong. I would let Martin be that wrong making yeah. the prediction because that's what he is paid to do. I, I don't make predictions in these kinds of races other than to say there will not be a green majority government, 110%. There will not be a green minority government. And there will not be likely an Andrea Horvath majority government. Beyond that, anything that allows for five other that allows for five other possibilities. Correct. Yeah. Well, I haven't done all the permutations, but probably yeah. five. So, <laughs> liberal minority or majority? Yes. Tory minority or majority? NDP minority? You think yes. all five of those things are possible? Possible, not probable, but possible. What do you say? I think he's right. You know that you, ha you have Is no idea fluid? what's going to happen. You know, somebody could start talking about you know foreign workers or you know religious schools when they weren't expected to, and that could go badly for them. I think the NDP have shown that their ground game is good, and there are ridings that they stand to pick up. I think Toronto is a big you know question mark. I think probably last year it would have been more of a lock for the Liberals with transit going their way. Now, not so sure. So yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of different ways it could pan out. Would you, Chris, agree with Martin Redcon that a Green minority or majority government is 110 percent? impossible? You're yes. Representing the party. Yeah, you couldn't pay me to disagree. <laughs> um, As for other permutations? Yeah, uh, yeah no, I, I, I agree with the table so far. I think one of the interesting things is that we don't know a lot about the, the party platforms yes, I mean, you were, you, yet you were trying to push uh, Horvath on this. Um, I think there's a lot of voters, again, who are unsure of who they want to support and they don't know what each of the parties stand for yet. Uh, so there is a lot of opportunity for it to move. I think religious schools is an interesting, religious schools funding is interesting. I obviously want someone to start talking about religious schools. I want them to start talking about ending religious discrimination in Ontario. That's I think there's a few... Just we should explain, because the Greens are in favor of defunding the separate well, school system. Well, they have system. been. When they, when they, in 2007, when the Green Party of Ontario got 8%, I think it was largely due to their strong support of ending funding of, of Catholic schools. Yeah. Um, they, they kind of, I think you pointed out in the last election, walked that back a bit and had a bit of a softer approach uh, and, uh, and, and didn't do as well. Now, it's always very dangerous to try and say exactly why that, that sort of thing happened. But I think there's a few, I think there's a few wedges on the table. I think there's something that, that for me, and I, I might be applying my own biases, but that, 
you know, allowing a, a private monopoly to sell all of our beer, a fi private for foreign-owned monopoly to sell all of, all of our beer that everyone seems okay with. Y you've you know? been reading his columns, haven't and you? So <laughs> you that's, a, that's a drum he there's, loves to beat. There, there are a few categories where I think there are, I think there's votes for the taking, mm -hmm. and I think there, I think there are these rare opportunities where it's both the right policy and a popular policy, and I don't know why anyone isn't picking them up <laughs> off the table, and, and that could make things And neither does he. One of the things I want to get a sense of around the table is whether or not the government that is seeking re-election in this election is a 15-month-old government or a 10-year-old government? And I don't know the answer to that question. What's the answer, Joanne? 10. <laughs> I didn't even hesitate. No, I mean, you know, obviously, and I've recently been sitting in on a few focus groups, right, where you get members of the public, you know, talking what about they politics say? and issues. Well, you know, they seem, they want to like Kathleen Wynne. You know, they seem to say, you know, she seems like a nice person. You know, she wants to do good things. But I just don't think she can get away from the, from the scandals. You know, people still, they kind of want her to succeed, but they're just so kind of fed up with the whole... Um, with, with the, what the Liberals have been doing for the last 10 years, and, and they really just don't have much confidence that she can get away from that. Paul, is this a 15-month-old government or a 10-year-old government? Well, it's coming up to 11 years, actually, because I have a strong memory of the 2003 election. Um, I, I think that we, in 2003, under Ernie Eves, tried to suggest that it was a new government and a different government, and it wasn't, certainly not in the minds of the voters. People went, yeah, I had enough of you. Uh, with us, they, they wanted a more peaceful regime, uh, that there was too much confrontation. I think at the end of the uh, McGinty win administration, it's like, oh, we're just tired of you people. And all that stinky stuff you've been doing, a billion on um, uh, gas plants, my hydro bill is so much higher, why aren't things getting any better? And I keep seeing deficit numbers go higher and higher and higher. And much in the same way in this budget, Kathleen Wynne has come in with a lot of stuff that sounds really good. If you take a look at that infamous 2003 budget held at the auto plant, um, Magna. Yeah, at Magna, you will see much of the same thing. And the public reaction then, I think, will be what it, it is, will be now, which is like, oh, we, don't, we don't buy any of that. Uh, what we want is leadership that cares about what we care about. Siri, clearly Kathleen Wynne's job after she won the leadership <laughs> was to make it seem as if this was a brand new liberal government. Yeah. How well do you think she has done in making that case? It's, it's a hard case to make, right? Because you have your internal pressures too, that a lot of people who work in your government came up through your predecessor, so you can't distance yourself too much without alienating the people who work for you, so it's hard. I think though that you're under, underestimating the drastic nature of the change that has happened in that government. She is a very different person. And just in her work ethic alone and the way that she runs her government and her commitment to the issues and, and the amount that she's out there, like Martin, you would have seen this, the amount that she's actually out on the trail and actually talking about these things and her grasp of the issues, I think you don't want to underestimate that. And I think that we do see that people say at the door, I don't like McGinty and I don't like the, the liberal brand, but I like her. And she's gotten people's attention in a very short amount of time. And I would be very worried. You, you said that she's untested on the campaign trail. I would not rest too easy on that because she will run anyone into the ground and I think she will be pretty impressive. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest that she won't be able to break through. Is this a ten and a half year old liberal government or a fifteen month old win government? I think it's a great question. I obviously don't have the answer but I think I have to agree that Kathleen Wynne is, is different from Dalton McGuinty in the same way that Andrea Horvath is different from Howard Hampton. They're just different leaders, different styles, different genders different policies, different approaches. Uh, just think of how the party of the NDP has, has shifted from under Hampton to Horvath to a more populist and less sort of doctrinaire orthodox new democratic party approach. So I think they are different. I also think it being a seven and a half week campaign, if you start today, there is a that lot long? of time. Seven and a half weeks? Uh, sorry, uh, Five six, and a half. Six, six and a half weeks, because it's six weeks, it's 41 days, plus we have okay. to add in, add in a few days starting to this unofficial phony war of today, Sure. Um, that, that I think people haven't really seen Kathleen win that much. So she is uh, an unknown commodity. So if you ask people today in a focus group, is she different from Dalton McGinty? You know, they have this vague notion of her from a year ago. But after six and a half weeks, she will have more of an opportunity to define herself, just as the opposition will try to frame her as McGinty, uh, an extension of McGinty. I don't think it'll be that easy to do that. I think they do have different approaches. I think the pension 
proposal is one thing that McGinty would never have attempted. He, he cared about pensions, but he never did anything about it, and I think she has shown that. On minimum wage, she's different from McGinty in, in what she did. So I think, I think she has an, an opportunity to define herself uh, in a way that, that Andrew Horvath did as well. Joanne, if you like the NDP, how concerned ought you to be that Labour appears very split right now, certainly in terms of what Andrew Horvath did on the budget, but maybe even going forward? Not particularly. I mean, you know, the, uh, in the past, the Canadian auto workers have endorsed Liberals as well. They haven't always been, you know, 100% on board with the NDP. So, you know, it's not like Labour, as Tim Hudak would have you believe, is this big, huge behemoth that, you know, Andrea Horvath is jumping at every time they say. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, not particularly concerned. I mean, obviously, you know, it's important to have the support. Um, of, of the unions and workers in general, but uh, you know, I think Andrea is right when she says, you know, it's it's more critical to have the support of, you know, voters and Ontarians mm -hmm. and and everybody. Of course, the organizations are important, but uh, you know, I, I don't think it's that big of a concern going into the campaign. Having said that, Can something called quick, yeah, go ahead. Though. It's not it's now Unifor, so it's the old CAW, mm -hmm. but it's mm -hmm. also an, it's an, it's a merger with another communications yes. and paper workers union. And you also have Sid Ryan of the OFL, who is a former NDP candidate, at least twice, I think. So that's yeah. interesting that Sid Ryan came out so strongly. Indeed. And, you know, we're trying to figure out here what Labor's going to do. And the Working Family Coalition, is that what they're called? Working Families Coalition? Are going to it's spend. Now, it's now Working Families for some reason. They dropped the coalition. Oh, they find it, okay. <laughs> they're going to spend five million bucks, I think, probably, trying to defeat Tim Hudak. Uh, how influential is that likely to be? I think that that really um, was a defining issue in the fall. Like you saw it with the premier, she started talking a lot about labor. Hudak started talking a lot less about it, and I think that it it will be a big deal. I think it was working quite well for her when she started talking about um, right to work and the dangers of that. Um, it took people's um, it caught their attention in a positive way. So I think you'll be hearing a lot about it. Chris, what about it? It was it's been very influential the last couple of campaigns in a row. Yeah, I don't think anyone should underestimate the, the, the influence that Labour can have, both, both with money and with feet on the ground. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I ran for, for City Council in 2010 against a candidate that was endorsed by Labour, and I thought that was going to be really bad for her because it was in an area that was not a left of center area, and it wasn't an area that typically voted for Labour candidates. But what it was able to do was provide a huge amount of volunteer power. And you saw um, today Wynn's event, it was firemen all behind her, right? Hmm. And so that ended up being really significant. It was an endorsement that I thought should should have hurt her based on on the platform she was running on and the electorate that she was going after, um, but it ended up being really, really critical part of her machinery. Why do you think, Paul, that the conservative forces in this province have yet to come up with uh, an equally competitive alternative to the working families formerly coalition, which is this group of unions that has put a lot of money behind the Liberal Party over the last few elections? Because the union organizations can uh, get that money out of their members, whether their members like it or not. And there is no non-union organization that can say, hey, we'd like uh, $5 million out of our membership to beat the snot out of the conservatives in the next election. There's no other organization that can do that. Uh, I think people have to take a look at this advertising, understand that unions don't do this for free, and they don't do it without the expectation of some very good things happening to them afterwards. Now, as far as the support for the budget is concerned, I would venture to say that if you take a look at some of the communities that are very heavily unionized, conservatives do quite well. Cambridge as an example, Oshawa being another. So while the union leadership can do this, that, or the other thing, if you're talking directly to the union members and talking about things that matter to them and their families, you will get their support even in areas where the unions are quote unquote quite strong. How's the influence of working families looking this time? Well. I think they owe a lot to Tim Hudak by way of thanks because they were in great disarray about a year ago after the Liberals pushed really hard on restraint and froze uh, salaries and alienated a lot of labor, in particular the teachers unions and the entire labor movement. So working families, maybe that's why they dropped the coalition from the name because they were in disarray. Tim Hudak went on a very strong attack against big labor to try to cut them down to size and brought the working families coalition back to life. So I think they do have the ability to spend a fair bit of money. A um, couple of million, I think, is, is roughly the order of magnitude. And they have the advantage of, as a third party, of, of being really negative 
and, and attacking somebody in a way that is unbecoming for a party or, or a political leader to do. So you can leave the, the tough stuff to these outsiders and you can try to be positive and aspirational on all of those things. So I, I would not underestimate working families. Uh, and I certainly would not underestimate the leaders either. I want to just go back to, to Kathleen Wynne. I think uh, one thing that strikes me about her is, is that, yes, she has a record. I think Tim Hudak uh, also should not be underestimated and has a great advantage in this campaign of being underestimated by a lot of media and a lot of voters who were not that impressed by what they saw the last time. And so if he exceeds those low expectations, suddenly he's, a, if not a hero, he's somebody who's doing better than expected. And Al he, although he'd be very different. He, he's... he's uh, I think he learned a great deal from the last campaign. I think he's going to, to use a sports analogy, stay within himself more. Uh, there aren't going to be the off-the-wall hot-button issues. You're going to see a very focused leader, a very focused campaign on a, a series of important issues. And he's not going to be thrown off stride. Although today he had an event where I'm, he was thrown off by the fact that he was at, what was the place with the music? Mississauga? Music, yeah. yeah it was Metal a, Works. Uh, yeah, Mississauga. a recording studio, and he didn't realize that that he had voted against uh, the music Canada grant or the Ontario music grant. Well, yeah. I think so, it's actually and, and against bribing companies. It's one of the yeah. things that uh, then don't have your event there. Well, here's the problem: because I was there this morning, I drove out, and the problem was that the his host was in favor of of the bribing of companies. I shouldn't use that word bribing <laughs> on air. But, all but his, his, host, his host spoke, his host spoke yeah, out his spoke out and welcomed yeah. this music fund. And so it was a bit awkward because the, he actually is a supporter of Tim Hudak, but not of his policy. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it was no, well, listen, I have, I have nothing against governments that will, uh, rather nothing against companies that will take money from government for free. I mean, <laughs> the government of Ontario is going around bribing successful companies to put businesses and jobs here as okay, opposed to offshore. We're talking about message discipline. I think you said yeah, focus. Listen, and this was an listen, unfocused listen, follow up. Listen, listen, and, and, and those are the things that you learn from. But what we're not I going mean, to see is, uh, I think, a lot of what we saw last time. I mean, this is not a campaign where, and one of the phrases you used, where I think we're going to see a lot of hot button issues. I don't think these these fly-by-night single wedge issues are going to be a great factor in well, this campaign. Well, let me try this. Let me try this. There is, uh, there is the ghost of, right, that's always a part of this campaign. Kathleen Wynne won't say Dalton McGinty's name. He is a ghost of, of Christmas past that continually is a presence in this campaign. Tim Hudak is going to hear over and over again that he's Mike Harris in short pants. And the specter of Mike Harris, the second coming of, is going to be there. And Andrea Horvath has to deal with Bob Ray, for goodness sakes, and that's 25 years ago already almost that he became Premier of Ontario. But that's still there with some people. How do you get past the ghost of? Because that's there. Well, the difference being is that Tim Hudak was a member of Mike Harris's government and Kathleen Wynne was a member of Dalton McGuinty's government, whereas I think um, Andrea Horvath was probably still in high school, maybe, when, uh, <laughs> I don't know. When Bob Ray, when was, Bob Premier. Ray was Premier. So, um, no, she wasn't in high school. <laughs> she was in her mid-twenties, but I get your point. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, look, I mean, it's something, it's always going to happen, and it's always, you know, how you get to the other parties. But, I mean, I think there's some legitimate things. You know, when you see a lot of Tim Hudak's policies right now are very similar. Some of the things he's saying he's going to do are very similar to the things that Mike Harris did. So I think it's completely legitimate to draw that comparison there. Chris? I think maybe you get past it by having a strong voice and a strong sense of why you want the job. And uh, I mean, Kathleen Wynne has been reminding me of Paul Martin a bit in the sense that it was like this, this I, I got this thing and I'm now taking over from the previous leader and why did I want to be here anyway? Um, I haven't felt like she's, I agree that she has a very strong personality that is, that feels different. So I, I get a sense of who she is. And I get a sense that she's a different person than Dalton McGinty. But I don't get a sense of her agenda. I don't get a sense of why she wanted the job and what she wants to implement. And, and You don't have a sense of that yet? After no, because all of the announcements? Feels, well, these announcements feel more like election campaign promises. They feel more like a lot of money being spent. It doesn't feel focused. It doesn't feel like a, a vision for the province. Madly and, running off in all directions. Yeah, it feels, it feels like um, trying to, I mean, Every single, no matter what she does, she's going to be asked about gas plants. Um, so every answer is another hundred million dollars for. I, I mean, I agree. Because like, a lot of hundreds of millions flying to companies that shouldn't be. Um, so it's a lot of spending. Um, it doesn't feel like a, a focused vision to me. It doesn't feel like okay. I understand who who you are in terms of what kind of premier you're going to be, and I think that would help get past the ghost a bit because then I can I can draw a clear delineation. How does Premier Wynne deal with her ghost? 
I think it's hard, and it's something we talked about right from the, the day after he resigned. There was debate about how far you can distance yourself from him. And one of the problems, and I, was, I think it was in your column today, you used the, the term throwing under the bus. And I think that's part of the problem. Is throwing that's under sort the of, campaign bus. Yeah, yes. and I think that Just to be clear, she, you were urging her to throw well, Dalton McGinty under the campaign bus. I wasn't bus. urging her to commit homicide, but I was simply <laughs> saying that it would, be, it, it, it would be expedient politically yeah. to be able to throw him under the campaign She's bus. never done that. She hasn't, and I think that the rhetoric is part of the problem, right? When you say it's throwing somebody under the bus, you're putting the blame on her, and there's a, there's a value judgment there. It's like the new snitching, right? And I think it's, I don't think any of us should use that term, because you don't get thrown under the bus. You play in traffic. You do it to yourself. She is not McGinty, and I think she's doing a good job now. She said that on day one. I'm Kathleen Wynne, and I'm running against Tim, Tim Hudak and Andrea Horvath. I don't disagree with Chris, however, in that, and I think it's it's not disingenuous. I think part of her issue is that she does want to be all things to all people, right? I don't think she's doing that because she doesn't think that that's right. I think it's not, it's not, um, you know, she's not doing it because it's pulling like that. That really is her. She wants to try and fix everything, but I agree with you that that, that doesn't read well as a campaign, right? You, you can't throw your leader under the bus no matter how much of a burden they are. And let me do say this is that I'd rather be in our party than carrying that Dalton McGinty burden around just a little bit more than I take Dalton McGinty over my Harris like. any day. Okay, and, <laughs> and you will, and you certainly will. But the reason you can't throw uh, your leader under the bus is that there are people in your party to whom uh, the former leader is still someone very important, yeah. and, and they're very loyal to them. And if you try and throw the leader under the bus, You've you end them. up with yeah. all of that party being much more fractured than you'd like it to be otherwise. There are people you depend on. If Ernie Eves had walked out at some point during the uh, uh, election in 2003 and thrown Mike Harris under the bus, half his campaign team would have quit on yeah. the, on and the next think, day. And, and we had that conversation, yeah, but it's you like you, you win the battle, but you lose the war, right? Mm. Like that's, right. that's the risk. So right. when, when somebody you says to it. Tim Hudak, you're nothing but Mike Harris in short pants, what does Tim Hudak say to show that he's his own guy and not burdened by that ghost? I think what he needs to do is do what he intends to do during the campaign, which is get back to talking about his message. And let's talk about the last 10 years, not the 10 years before the last 10 years, or in the case of Bob Ray, the five years before the last 10 years before the last 10 years. I, I think it's a matter of talking about the future instead of the past. And, I don't, and that applies to all of the campaigns, uh, to the Liberals. If, we're, if we want to talk about what happened you know, who's in the room at the time when the decisions were made about X, Y, and Z. I think that voters are tuning that out, and what they do want to do is talk about what the future looks like and why it would be better for them. So let's, we've got a few minutes to go here, and I'd like to go quickly around the table and just get a sense from all of you. What's the big issue this election is going to be about? Joanne. Uh only get to pick one. Just um, one. I'm going to go with jobs and financial security. People feel very insecure right now. They're worried. Their kids are coming out of college and not being able to find jobs. So, you know, I think that's going to be the number one. Martin. I think jobs and the economy. I think that's what's everywhere these leaders have been going for the last year. That's what's been on people's minds. What they have to do, though, is somehow persuade people that they actually have an answer on jobs and the economy and that they're not just talking about it. Paul. Uh, absolutely. Jobs and the economy and whether that's going to be built with a strong private sector or whether we're going to see continued public sector spending on jobs that just puts Ontario further into debt, further into deficit, a billion dollars more spending in the most recent budget. I mean, even Dalton McGuinty and Dwight Duncan got the idea there should be restraint. Andrea Horvath even talked about there's too much in that budget. Meanwhile, Kathleen Wynne is spending in a way that no one has seen before. So it's two competing visions about what Ontario needs. Chris. I'm, I want to be different, so I'm going to say it's, it's a meta issue of, of trust and, and faith in the, in the fundamental ability of, of a political party to govern. And, and do I trust you? And are you going to be accountable? And is there transparency? And who do I hold accountable? This is, this is the other issue that's at play when we're talking about ghosts, is, okay, you're a new person, but the old person's gone. Who do I hold accountable? So I think trust and accountability is, is for me, the meta issue that's driving who I trust to implement, and that's some of Andrew Horvath's language as well. Who do you trust to actually implement the policies that you that you believe in? Given the 49% voter turnout two and a half years ago, my hunch is a lot of people have said none of the above. Yeah. What do you say to those folks? I've I, I don't know. I've been there. I I, I uh, it should be an opportunity. It should be an opportunity for the Green Party. It should be an opportunity for any party um, to offer something better. And I think that. 
everyone, it feels to me like politicians really want to be safe, right? They don't want to have a gaffe. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of, they all, we all sound the same now. Everyone, everyone is working families, middle class, you know, it's, it's all, and it, it all sounds like noise. Yeah. So if someone just started saying something that was actually real and used words that actually had meaning, um, that could go a long way. And, and I think that voters who feel like they don't have a choice, I have a hard time blaming them. I don't vote shame. I, I, think, that, uh, I think that it's up to politicians to actually offer something that's worth voting for. Siri, what's the one issue this election is going to be about? I agree with, with Chris. They're all going to say jobs and the economy, but it comes down to when they look at those three people saying the exact same thing, who do you believe and who can express it in a tangible way, right? Like you have to make it matter to people in their real lives. What am I going to see that's different? And whoever can make that case and whoever can make it real, I think has the best chance. Uh, are media too cynical to allow that to happen? Serious question. I do. I agree with Chris, and I think it's it's the politicians and a bit of the media as well that, you know, you say, well, we'll just ask these questions for the first two days, even though we know it's not a big deal. Like, we have to start talking about these things differently. We have to think about the phrases we use and the polls we run and the questions we ask and whether it's, hap like, whether it's helping. We're all having an impact, and we're all driving people away by, you know, not demanding better. And I really think that that's the shame of all of this, is that there are a lot of people who look at all three and say, I don't know who to choose. That's not, that shouldn't be the way it is. Well, our job here is to help people figure that out. And we're going to do something on the Ontario election every single show from now until the 12th of June. And my hunch is we'll be doing a post-mortem on the 13th mm -hmm. as well. So if you like Ontario politics, here's your place to be. Uh, thank you to the five of you for coming in tonight. We really appreciate your help on this. The, uh, what are we, day three? It's early. The writs haven't even yeah, been dropped yet. Uh, uh, excuse don't say, me. Don't say drop. <laughs> Drawn up. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Governor David Onley said, you draw up the writs, you don't drop them. They've been dropped in Westminster for centuries. Yes. I'm not going to ignore that. <laughs> 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 okay. Thanks, everybody. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.